So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Maureen Quinn, Senior Director of Programs. Welcome to the International Peace Institute and today's policy forum on dialogue as a critical tool for peace building, lessons from Burundi. It is my great pleasure to ask Ambassador Cardi, the permanent representative of Italy to the United Nations, to come to the podium to give opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Quinn. Thank you to the IPI for this uh, another occasion to uh, work with you. We have always been successful, and today I think people are standing in the room, so it's, uh, it's packed. We are happy. We were talking about uh, that with um, uh, Don Romano and um, the former SS SRSG, and uh, maybe it's the right time in difficult moment moments for the Burundi um, uh, state, but also uh, we think it's uh, uh, appropriate to discuss one of the issues that can, you know, um, affect peace and security in Africa. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, as I said, Parfait Onanga Anyanga, who was the former uh, SRSG until 2014, I think, so you, you have uh, knowledge. Of course, the uh, Assistant Secretary General, Oscar Fernandez Taranco. Uh, the IPI, of course, through you, uh, Ambassador Queen, and, uh, and of course, uh, the special presence of uh, Don Romano, who has been uh, of the Comunità Sant'Egidio, who has been one of the <coughs> key players, the Comunità, but also Don Romano, in Burundi since many, many years, uh, for many, many years. <coughs> I mean, actually, I just uh, had some notes, but, you know, the idea of this meeting came to us when we started a few months ago to uh, examining the review of the peace building, peacekeeping uh, architecture, uh, which is uh, probably one of the most important uh, um, uh, <clears throat> processes going on at the UN right now. Uh, because we have to recognize that there are some issues and there are some problems. Uh, and the idea was really from the start to bring uh, the experience, an Italian experience also, you know, also, the Comunità is international, but it's mainly Italian as tradition, as culture. Um, and they, of course, as you know very well, have been uh, active in many countries in Africa, uh, not only in Africa, but Africa especially, Mozambique, uh, Burundi, and others. Um, and what is the key issue uh, for us, the importance of the Comunità, what they have done, what they are doing, is to uh, not only help on mediation, on prevention of conflicts, but to do so in a way that the country does not relapse into conflict, because this is the crucial issue we are facing in many, many parts of the world, and in Africa especially, as we are seeing now on a very delicate situation <coughs> in, uh, in Burundi. So today, uh, by the way, we organized this event, uh, and it's been organized in the margins of the Peace Building Annual Meeting. Uh, we had a very interesting exchange of view this morning with all the participants here. Um, and I made some very short comments. And the first one was that the Peace Building Commission, the Peace Building Architecture is key to the work of the United Nations. Today, much more than it was before, because terrorist networks, um, criminal networks, and they work most of the time together, are uh, gaining advantage are thriving in instability. And the more instability we have around the world, we see that in Syria and Libya, the more problems the world will have, not only the continent in which they are happening, the world will have. So peace building as a tool of the United Nations is a central tool. We have to reduce the area of instability altogether. This is where the experience of Comunità Sant'Egidio and uh, the former SRSG is so crucial. The second is that uh, uh, <clears throat> we had some comments a few days ago talking to Rosenthal, he's uh, uh, chairing the, the panel, the review panel for the peace building. He said sometimes, you know, most of the time, peacekeeping operations are there, then they leave and the country is left alone. So there is a need now to, we have three uh, issues at the UN. Mediation, which is the core business, prevention and mediation, peacekeeping, this is where you, you, know, you put water to extinguish the fire and then um, peace building. So we have to come to a situation in which these three elements work together. They do not work together as they should now. So for us, it's very important. The peacekeeping budget is $9 billion. Humanitarian aid, $20 billion. Peace building fund, 100 million, maybe less than that to now. 
uh, special political mission, $600 million. So there is an imbalance. We have to reduce that. The follow-up of the review of the peacekeeping and peace building will be crucial because we have to help the UN, help the member states to find a better balance, mediation, peacekeeping, peace post-conflict. Uh, the third thing, very um, quickly, is that it is possible. Uh, I remember every time it is a different situation from Africa, of course, where the situation is much more complicated, but Albania, 1997. Italy asked, uh, uh, you know, took the initiative at the UN to seek a mandate to stabilize Albania. It was not only a, you know, a peacekeeping operation, it was a whole range of operation on the ground, and uh, it was done. And by the way, migration were part of the problem because at that time, thousands and thousands of people were crossing the Mediterranean to Italy, as it is happening now from Libya, from Africa, from Libya. It was done. European countries, not all European countries, were able to address the root causes, the root causes, this is very important, to address the instability and to stabilize the country. Today, thousands of Italian and European investors are flocking to Albania, which has been has become a golden opportunity for economic um, uh, growth. So, I mean, of course, as I said, situation is dif different, but it can be done. Peace building uh, is a critical tool. I will end up here. I thank you again. Uh, I will, I'm sure it will be a very interesting panel. Uh, sorry, I was also forgetting that uh, we have Ambassador Paul Seger, uh, the chair of the Burundi configuration of the Peace Building Commission. So we are going to hear from you also and to uh, benefit from your important experience in the country where you are going in a few days. So you can talk about that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cardian, for um, putting this issue in uh, perspective, but also taking the opportunity to look at experience uh, from else, elsewhere uh, in the world. Um, I, I'm going to st start off um, um, by just uh, saying what, what kept coming to my mind uh, when I thought about this uh, event today, and I think we had a little bit of this discussion when we met just in, the, in our um, uh, side room here before we came in, I kept saying to myself in uh, thinking about today's event, uh, kept nagging me is, you know, here we have Burundi. It's a country at a, at a, it's at a critical time. It's an ongoing, you know, uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the demonstrators in the street, refugees, et cetera. And so I said, I kept saying to myself, I'm really looking forward to hearing from this panel, to hear from these experts. So what can be done? What are the possibilities? What are the tools and approaches for creating the time and the space for dialogue? And this, these, these are, we have assembled here uh, great experts uh, just to do that. Because we, we want to, we wanna, dialogue is a critical tool for peace building. Um, we're looking at the case of Burundi for lessons learned, and we can draw lessons, obviously, from elsewhere. But this uh, opportunity around how do you create that time and that space for dialogue. So thank you. Ambassador Cardi introduced our speakers, but our plan is as follows. I'll turn first to Parfait Onanga. Parfait is the former representative of the Secretary General and uh, the head was the head of the UN office in Burundi. He's currently back here at the United Nations taking on another a tough job on coordinating related to Boko Haram. We'll turn to Parfait first. I'm then going to turn to um, uh, Oscar Fernandez Taranko, the Assistant Secretary General and the head of the United Nations Peace Building Support Office. He also has extensive field and headquarters experience to talk uh, on this issue. And then thirdly, we are very glad to have Don Angelo Romano, uh, from the International Department of the Community Saint Egido, and he brings experience from Burundi, but he's also worked on peace negotiations for Mozambique, Liberia, Guinea, Central African Republic. So we have a great panel. I've asked each of, we've asked each of them to talk about uh, five minutes or so, maybe a little bit more, but around that marker, so that we can have opportunity for a really strong dialogue. So with that, I give you the mic, Parfait. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Thank you for the, for the opportunity. Um, uh, yesterday, I was uh, pretty upbeat and happy to, to come to this meeting. And, uh, and I put down a few notes, um, very um, hopeful of the prospect for the dialogue to, to resume in Burundi. And then this morning, um, 
I got news of much um, recent developments in, in Bujumbura. And I came here a bit uh, grumbling and uh, asking uh, uh, Ambassador um, uh, Sebastiano, who got the idea of um, inviting me on this panel. <laughs> and um, to complicate things, I, I came and, and forgot my, my reading glasses, so I'm blind. <laughs> so I cannot read. And, and um, I, I thank my friend uh, Oscar for uh, offering his, uh, his lenses. Um, but um, I mean, this is really the, the state of, uh, of mind in which I am. Uh, I know very few people, uh, except for Burundians, and some of them are in this room, who have um, come you know, um, in contact with Burundi and not uh, get away loving this land and these people. And then we all become very biased because we, we, um, we sometimes show so much um, passion and, uh, and um, you know, um, um, eagerness to see things um, uh, transform quickly in Burundi and that we, um, we are easily accused of, um, um, by either side, of, of being uh, biased and, and not, not helping the situation um, on the ground. Because bottom line is, um, uh, this is a country that is extremely uh, polarized. Nothing is easy. Um, I feel very strongly for my friend and elder, uh, Saeed Jinid, a man that many of you know, um, who went to Burundi, um, asked by the leaders of, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the political establishment in this country on both sides to go and facilitate the political process. He ended up being uh, accused by one side, and in this case, the opposition, of um, not reflecting their views and therefore not at all um, legitimate in their eyes to help facilitate the political dialogue in the country. Then uh, they were asked, um, they asked the, the UNSG to quickly reappoint someone because um, there was an urge for the dialogue to resume. And it wasn't a diff an easy decision to take. But how could we refuse um, um, and engaging in a, in a dialogue, in a fruitful dialogue, hopefully, in Burundi? And therefore, the decision was made to ask another uh, you know, uh, senior uh, official, um, SRSG Batili, who was already responsible for the region, working from Libreville, heading UNOCA. And as he got there, um, and excuse my expression, he got shot at um, by the ruling party and, and being accused of all kinds of things. Uh, some of them are simply, I mean, most of them are simply untrue. And uh, so we, we are in this situation where it looks like it's, uh, it's an impossible task to help um, bringing those um, absolutely uh, diverging camps into um, a negotiating table. And we are many who tried hard um, in the past. And I'm very happy that when I received the, um, the um, outline for this meeting, I was inviting to speak in the past. So therefore, it's a very convenient position. I will not be taking any risk and to commenting on the current situation. Uh, but we are very worried to see that what is happening um, um, remind us um, much of um, um, things of the past and things of um, um, a brutal past, um, more with um, violence, um, cyclical violence of a different nature and they are really uh, uh, Father uh, Angelo uh, from uh, Santa Digio uh, would be the authoritative voice to speak on Burundian, uh, Burundi's past because um, he is representing an organization that has you know, dedicated so much effort 
into bringing Burundi um, back from the brink uh, to the current situation. And we are many to say, as we were leaving, my family and colleagues and I, where we were leaving Burundi on, uh, at the end of December, alongside uh, Paul, here present, uh, we were, you know, we had this bittersweet feeling. Um, we were taking stock of a government that was very assertive and very eager to assume its sovereign right to be in charge of the, uh, you know, the, the country's uh, political governance. Uh, and what is wrong with that? Nothing. And, and therefore, we said, um, uh, bravo, as we leave, and I, 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 I say that the first day I arrive in Burundi, when the UN will be leaving Burundi, uh, we all would have won. Burundi would have won in credibility, in stability and peace, and the UN would have done a good job uh, because we would have left a good legacy of a country which uh, we were many ready to proclaim a very successful peace building story. Um, but today I'm in a different place. Um, um, uh, we left a country which was in a relative peace and stability, a country that has achieved so much. Uh, they, have the, that they have agreed upon a very comprehensive strategic uh, framework for their future, for, the, for, for, for their development. Um, they had successfully uh, reformed their army, which um, you know, moved from the, what it was before, and, uh, uh, mainly you know, um, uh, ethnically driven army to become rather a national you know, uh, and professional army. We, we left a country where partners uh, led by Paul were eager to come and help, and we had a very successful Geneva conference uh, process where the peace building, and Oscar was there too, uh, the peace building was prepared, you know, gearing up to try to see how they can really ring fence all the gains and ensure that Burundi uh, does not fall back. Um, uh, we left the country with um, a permanent um, uh, um, national electoral body, uh, which had already organized two successful elections. Uh, of course, there were issues, uh, but we left we let, uh, a country where we hope that um, the future was rather you know, um, um, promising. But we also left a country where uh, so much needed still to be done. Um, we left a country which was preparing for this election, uh, which is going to start on 29th of, of, of June, a um, um, uh, 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 very um, scary um, uh, coincidence to me it will be my birthday, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where they will be having the legislative and you know uh, local elections, um, and 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 then we knew we knew um, already at that time that the elephant in the room for that country would be the third term, or let me put it differently because I may be accused of taking sides already will be the whole issue of the eligibility or ineligibility of the incumbent president. And um, therefore, we um, agreed that this was a matter to be taken really seriously. And because elections, unfortunately, in Burundi and but in so many other places are still what they shouldn't be, a trigger for conflict. Um, it was decided that it would be safer if we could ensure, and the council made the right decision to send in Burundi uh, when Benub's time uh, came to an end, to send to Burundi what is called Minub, which is an electoral assistance mission to really provide technical assistance and um, also ensure that the framework for dialogue that was left would uh, enable the country to uh, move past the um, um, syndrome of the 2010 elections where, uh, as you may be aware, the opposition decided to boycott those elections. And uh, Maureen, I will be stopping soon, but just to say that it was an unfortunate decision by the opposition to boycott the elections. And I was among those who um, was uh, strong uh, in repeating that. And I know um, I didn't make many friends by, by saying that. But it was a big mistake, 
and I'm afraid that same mistake may be committed again, may be made again. Uh, but this time, um, uh, one is wondering whether um, um, they really will have an option. Because um, let me force myself to read this. Um, what the AU chairperson um, said about the situation in Burundi was the following, and I quote, only dialogue and consensus based on the respect of the Arusha Agreement and the Constitution of Burundi will make it possible to find a political and consensual solution to the crisis. I urge the Burundian parties to lead full cooperation, to lend full cooperation to the effort made to this end by the ESC, the ICJLR, the United Nations, and the AU with the support of the rest of the international community. Only dialogue and consensus based on the respect of Arusha and the Constitution. And my concern, and I will end here, Maureen, my concern is that today um, this dialogue is in, a, in bad shape. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Parfait, and to have your perspective from your having uh, been there uh, and having left relatively recently to today and uh, also your, your experience. But I particularly like how you uh, ended there, going back to the emphasis on consensus and dialogue based on the Constitution and the Arusha Agreement. And I hope we can talk a little bit more about that, the framework uh, for that, what I call the political space in our discussion. But I'd like to give the mic to Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Quinn and Ambassador Cardi and all the participants here in the high table, but also uh, to acknowledge, of course, the presence of Ambassador Seeger, who normally, any time we talk about Burundi, he's always part of the, of the, of the conversation and the uh, setting, if you will, the, 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 the framework of, of the discussions. Let me just start by saying that, I mean, there are real experts on Burundi here. I'm not one of them. But what I can speak to maybe is what the Peace Building Commission and the Peace Building Fund, uh, as a, a very important instrument of the Peace Building Support Office that I had have been trying to do in Burundi, because actually Burundi was the first country, the first country to have come to the attention of the Peace Building Commission. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be had in terms of what has worked, what hasn't worked, in terms of peace building priorities, what type of investments, what has been the role of the United Nations, what has been the role of the international community, and how have all these efforts actually complemented, strengthened each other or not. Uh, and last but not least, something that uh, Parfait was just alluding to, the rising and important role also of the regional actors here, the, the, the immediate neighbors that play increasingly in many of the countries where we have peace building challenges and programs uh, a very fundamental role. So without going to some of the issues that Ambassador Cardi referred to in the upcoming reviews that I think will be taking quite a lot of lessons, Burundi was one of the five case studies of the peace building review. And so when we look at Burundi and we look back and we see, well, what were we trying to do? Because I think there's been one consistent uh, thread of support that runs since 2006-2007 uh, was this support to dialogue, to the fact that part of the challenges of peace building is this notion of inclusive political dialogue. Peace building is highly political, it's not a technical or technocratic exercise. And in the case of Burundi, we had the advantage, of course, of having a mandated mission on the ground that had as one of its fundamental purposes to bring peace to build reconciliation, to somehow uh, reconcile the warring parties and actually engage in the process of state building, democratic uh, institutions, and again, uh, redefining and interpreting and translating the constitution, the Arusha principles, and the fundamental issues of, of, of rule of law. So interestingly, the Peace Building Fund, if you look at all the projects, I think Burundi has been one of the countries that has received the most funding from the fund, has been about supporting this democratic process of participation, inclusion, and if anything, dialogue, many times uh, undertaken by the direct authority of the special representative or the secretary general on the ground. And importantly, because I think we do have to keep coming back to some of the important 
if you will, uh, foundations on which this peace building architecture was built, was basically the support and the building up of the ceasefire accords. We must not forget that only a few recent years back, we were still disarming. We were still trying to get important leaders of the armed rebellion back into the country, back into joining the political process, back into being established political entities and not armed non-state actors actually engaged in violent uh, manifestations of overthrow of the government. So a big part of what the Peace Building Support Office, my predecessors for the most part, uh, heading the office, were very much aligning the efforts of support into something that the international community usually finds very difficult to do, is financing political dialogue, financing inclusive engagement of the sort that Parfait and his predecessors were trying to engage. So I won't go into everything that, uh, that you know, the different phases of that national dialogue, and certainly in, uh, before Parfait left Burundi, I think one of the most crucial elements was that initial beginning of a more civil, engaged, uh, and engaged democratic dialogue among the key political uh, figures. Um, we have, and I think uh, under the uh, auspices of the Peace Building Commission, and I won't go into this, but it has been quite interesting to see that as the mission did pull out, um, and as maybe the attention of Burundi slipped from the Security Council, that actually the Peace Building Commission, at least in my very limited experience with this body, has started to show the potential, the opportunities that the Peace Building Commission actually does have in terms of support to mediation processes, in terms of preventing a relapse back into conflict, and actually engaging you know, the so-called, the relevant actors to this crisis, the relevant internal actors, the national actors, but the relevant sub-regional actors and the actors actually based here in New York. And I can't uh, attest, to, uh, I can't say enough and praise enough the leadership of Ambassador Sager, um, equally the leadership of, the, of Ambassador Skog and the Vice Chair of the Peace Building Commission, Ambassador Patriota, in terms of bringing forward that political dimension in the discussion among member states and actually addressing issues that until recently had been addressed in the Security Council, except with no enforcement mandate of any kind, trying to get the actors to look and see this increasingly, uh, how do you say, uh, coming closer and closer to this cliff that um, Parfait was talking about. Uh, because I know that uh, Brother Angelo Romano is going to be giving you an interesting historical perspective, and I think it's always important to put things in a historical perspective, let me just share with you what my team has shared with me in terms of what have we learned in Burundi, in terms of what we were trying to do, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and maybe engage some of your own thinking uh, going forward. Again, I, 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 I refer to the contributions we thought we made to that permanent forum for dialogue between political parties, and the fact that I think the FNLN was successfully disarmed through a very engaged disarmament process that we were very much engaged in uh, financing and supporting their transformation into a political party. However, and I think um, Parfait was just alluding to this, I think something fundamental happened in 2010 when the opposition decided to boycott the elections. Actually, a lot of the assumptions on the way that the UN and the international community were engaging with Burundi suddenly transformed themselves because you started seeing different political trajectories. And the boycott did have consequences in terms of the strength, in terms of the ability of the oppositions and the opposition groupings to either become more cohesive or continue to splinter and become more divided in terms of traction also in the political process. Um, I think that what the boycott and its consequences actually suggest, and this I think is an important lesson, is that external interventions have limitations in terms of the internal processes that are needed and the issue of national ownership, national leadership in these issues need to be really uh, be, how do you say, catered for and being paid special attention. The post-2010 landscape actually brought new challenges in terms of trusts between citizens and state, the trust factor of the state that was being constructed. And that needed to be reascertained. I think we kept working under false assumptions of what had led us to be engaged before that. And despite the poverty reduction strategy, despite the tremendous efforts that were done with the Geneva Conference to bring additional resources, and that actually was an opportunity to go beyond the mere 
technocratic way in which some of these donor roundtables are formed. It was a space for political discussion, but it did not necessarily rebuild the trust or reopen the space of dialogue. I think it suddenly became very much focused to strengthening a government in place without realizing that that government civil society interaction became important. And so, um, again, that the, 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 there, was, there were hopes going into this 2015 electoral process. Um, uh, one of the lessons may be equally important and that we're learning is that uh, not only is it challenging for external actors to facilitate national dialogues, that's the situation, and I think Parfait lived this in his own carne uh, propia, uh, like we say in Spanish, in his own flesh, how difficult it is for external actors to actually facilitate. He did a commendable job. We've seen what trappings actually the whole dialogue supported by Ginit fell into. But the, it's very difficult to have national dialogue where the, the, the trust factor and the leadership factors are not present with the national stakeholders. And so for the UN, this was made even worse, I think, with the withdrawal of the mission. I think this has been quite a significant um, challenge that I think you know, needs revisiting. What led to the rapid um, sizing down of that mission. Another important issue here is who do we engage in dialogue? And I think maybe of all the issues that we could have done a better job at is engaging youth and engaging women earlier, more profoundly, and more significantly. Again, I think we get caught in the trappings of official uh, structures and political parties. And yet, as we know, and certainly in the case of Burundi, where we see new mutations and new organizations and new developments taking place, that how youth are incorporated or not and in what manner, that whole issue of engagement of the youth and women um, needs to be relooked at. And it's certainly something that we are currently uh, looking into with the Peace Building Commission, particularly as all the neighbors have called for the disarmament of the youth wings of political parties that now has become a new triggering factor of sorts going forward. Um, last but not least, and despite this current situation that we all confront regarding these upcoming elections, important will be how we continue to engage in dialogue. Because I think the worst thing that can happen in Burundi is that there is no mechanism for those who win, for those who lose, for those who are included today, excluded tomorrow, that that dialogue is a fundamental part of establishing trust, of establishing the predictability of the actions of the different actors. And so again, how, and I think Parfait was alluding to this, how the international construct of the facilitation process between the African Union, the East African community, the United Nations, and other important actors, how to coordinate better that facilitation process, how to be more inclusive, and how to prepare the ground for the day after these elections um, is going to be, I think, the biggest challenge for peace building going forward in that you know, peace building, again, takes a lot of effort, a lot of uh, reconfiguration, if you will, of the political forces of the country. Thank you very much, Ambassador Quinn. Thank you very much, Oscar. I think uh, you uh, really did touch on some of the uh, ongoing lessons, but some of uh, the difficult lessons. I'm very glad you pointed out as well the importance of the role of women and youth in this process, not only in the past, but also going forward. And I hope we can come back to that later. But I'm very pleased now to turn the mic over to um, Don Angelo and to get uh, his perspective, given uh, we were talking his involvement and understanding of Burundi going back even to 1995. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And uh, thank to the speakers who spoke before me. I share uh, what uh, Parfait said uh, about the love for Burundi. Uh, I started to deal with the Burundi problem in 95, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, Burundi, uh, when I visited the country, the country is one of the most beautiful, beautiful places I've ever seen. But uh, I want to speak about the people. Uh, the people of Burundi are remarkable. Is one of the most poor country in the world. I think the second uh, in the statistics. Uh, there is a dignity. There is a tradition. 
there is a story of Burundi. Burundi is not invented by the Berlin Conference. Burundi existed uh, as a kingdom since the 17th century. It's one of the oldest countries in Africa. Uh, there is a re the richness of the history and tradition of Burundi is uh, remarkable. So uh, when we started to deal with Burundi in Sant'Egidio was 94. 94, uh, we were uh, in the middle of the implementation of the peace agreement for Mozambique that was signed in the 4th of October 92 in Sant'Egidio. Uh, when the uh, Rwandan genocide started, suddenly started, we are shocked like many others in the world. And uh, we are shocked and we are, we are trying to understand what, what was, uh, I mean, uh, why all that was happening and why, what could be done to avoid something uh, similar. And many people were talking us saying, well, the next, is, the next will be Burundi. The next will be Burundi. And Burundi is the same ethnic composition, the same problems. Uh, it's only uh, the, the, the country of Rwanda. Rwanda was ruled by the Hutu. Burundi is ruled by the Tutsi. You will see is next. So we tried uh, to to do something. Tried to do something. So that's why when we started to meet uh, the people of Burundi to listen to the people. And uh, when I when I say people, I say not only politicians. Uh, the advantage of Santa Giria is that we are not uh, government, so we can listen to everybody. And sometimes what, what an old man told you is much more important than what an ambassador or what a minister tells you. Uh, and uh, we saw uh, the history of a country, a history of suffering, tragedies, or hidden pages. Uh, there were pages of the history of Burundi which were completely hidden. And this was uh, creating a situation of uh, absolute mistrust and absolute fear. We started uh, to deal with the crisis uh, invited by the, f the president at that time of Burundi, Sylvester Tibantugania. He was the president of a United Nation, uh, a United, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, um, national unity government. Uh, uh, supported by the United Nations, which was created after a coup d'etat made in 93, which uh, followed the first democratic elections of the country, 93. During this putsch, this military putsch, the elected president, a Hutu, the first Hutu president of Burundi, was killed, horribly killed. Many ministers were killed. The president of the National Assembly was killed. Uh, so it was a bloodbath. Uh, so that was the country in which we, we started to deal with. And uh, we saw uh, a really a paradox, um, a government of a national unity in which the, vi the victims were accusing members of the government of being involved in Putsch. And the rebel movement in the Bush uh, fighting for democracy, as they were saying, the CNDD, National Council for the Defe Defense of Democracy. Uh, that rebel movement uh, was accused to be a sort of uh, inter hamwe uh, movement like in Rwanda, the, uh, like a movement who was preparing the extermination of the Tutsi. So what we did was try, I mean, what, what the president asked us was, uh, was trying to find a way to speak with this rebel movement. And so we did it, and uh, the first meeting between government people and members of the rebel movement was in Sant'Egidio in late 95. And, uh, but the crisis of Burundi needed a real synergy. And that's the, 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 the point that I want to remark, and maybe something that is needed now. Uh, we, I mean, uh, nobody has the magic key to solve the problem in Burundi, but we need to, to we need each other. We need the international community, we need the regional uh, countries, we need the civil society, we need everybody. We need a re religious leader too. And uh, we must create a positive synergy. And what happened to Burundi in the beginning was exactly that. We started a collaboration with uh, the former president of Tanzania, Moli Munirere, which started uh, with the mandate of the regional countries, a uh, political dialogue for Burundi, he immediately contacted us. 
And we started cooperation with Nirere uh, and with the Arusha, Arusha peace process. And uh, Arusha was like a school of democracy for a generation of Burundi politicians. Uh, Nyerere died in 98, if I'm not wrong, and uh, was immediately replaced by Nelson Mandela. We continued that effort of peace. And uh, I think the Arusha peace process is the last uh, gift, we can say, of Nelson Mandela to the international community and to Africa. Uh, we have to say that since the beginning, Nyerere was, uh, Nyerere doctrine was, uh, we, ma we need the African solution to African problems. And this is an important point because uh, uh, we must keep the African perspective on the issues of uh, democracy and uh, freedom uh, and uh, civil rights. And uh, so uh, the, the Arusha peace process, uh, the Arusha agreement in 2000 was a, was a success, but was the beginning of, a, I mean, the beginning of a new process, the post Arusha process. Uh, which uh, um, involved many parts, political and military movements, which were uh, the result of uh, different splits of the major armed groups. Uh, looking back, 95, and looking Burundi now, uh, I have to say that uh, I'm worried too. I mean, uh, the, the, pre the present situation is not good. But what I have to say is that uh, the country is different now. It's no longer the country in 95. It's no longer the country in 95. It's no longer the same army. It's no longer the same civil society. It's no longer uh, the same political parties. It's a different country. So, uh, so much important achievements were reached. And uh, we shall not come back to the past, shall not. And I believe that uh, the population of Burundi wants absolutely peace. Uh, the richness of the tradition of the Burundi history is so big that we shall not destroy or humiliate a country which can be an example not only for Africa, but also even for the world. Uh, we shall not come back to the past. So I, I think uh, what we need now is to, uh, to, I mean, to find uh, room and uh, framework for dialogue in a country in which the tension reached a very high level. Uh, we need time and space for dialogue. And whatever will happen in the next, in the next days in Burundi, because unfortunately the situation is really uh, very, very uh, volatile. Uh, whatever will happen in Burundi in, next, in the next days or week, uh, I'm sure the way out will be dialogue. There's no other way out. And uh, looking back, uh, I remember very well what uh, which were the efforts of Nelson Mandela during the dialogue with the Burundian people, uh, showing the experience of South Africa, showing the need of reconciliation. Uh, Mandela used to, used to have many persons with him coming from the different sides of the South African, South African state administ administration. Once he showed in the in face of the Burundian, uh, Burundian uh, uh, representatives, two mem members of the South African Defense Forces, and one was, the, was a member of the South African Defense Forces during the apartheid, and uh, another one was a member of the Inconto Wesizwe, the armed wing of INC. And they, they, were, they were friends, they were speaking and and uh, saying, well, I am used to call him a communist. And the other one was saying, well, I'm new, I, I was used to call him a fascist. And now we're working together. So uh, the effort was big. Uh, and I believe that uh, we cannot waste all this. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to uh, help the Burundian people uh, to have a future and uh, not to come back to a 
sad past that uh, we, we must leave absolutely behind us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Don and Jella, and I really appreciate that, uh, that perspective. You have to look back, you have to, to create, I think, the, the political time and space for dialogue. You do need to look to history. Now, it is my great pleasure to uh, ask uh, Ambassador Sager from the floor to, to make some remarks. We, we here at IP, I know you very well and what you've done for Burundi. You've done a lot of it uh, right here in this room. So. Uh, on both the area of political accompaniment and in the area of resource mobilization. So, Ambassador Seger of Switzerland. No, no, I'm from here. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the um, for this very interesting panel. And basically, I can I can be rather short because I agree with with all what has been said on, on this panel uh, during this lunchtime. Well, f for me, well, the question is. Well, I'm, I'm concluding soon my, my five-year stint as a PPC chair. Um, the question is, have we succeeded as a PPC configuration to uh, promote dialogue towards what has been said quite rightly, um, a non-relapse of conflict and um, stability? I think the jury is still out. Um, I, I, can't, I would not say at this point of time that we have failed, but I would not say either that we have succeeded. What we, we have been trying to do is um, through mostly quite discreet uh, dialogue, and I think that's an element which I think is quite important as a PPC, um, to, to foster an atmosphere of openness, of inclusivity, of creating a situation whereby um, these elections of 2015 would, would be held better than 2010. Well, so far, I think the picture is still mixed with the elections are not taking place yet, but you know, I agree with others, we are in a, in a quite difficult uh, situation as we speak. I think I agree with, with others that in this process, you need a lot of things, but mostly you need two things. I think passion, you need to love the country and, and patience. I think um, has been rightly said over the last 10 or 20 years, Burundi has come quite far. But if you look at the situation historically speaking, we are still in a very short time frame, despite the very tragic events 20 years back. And I use an example also in my contacts with people from Burundi from my own past of Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is seen by many today as maybe a model of democracy and, and peace. Well, you know, we had a tiny little civil war back in 1848, which caused 170 dead. 170. The political effects of which were still felt 140 years later. So how do you expect a country of Burundi with maybe 200, 300,000 dead? to overcome such tragic events within a time frame of 10 years. So I think we need to be aware of the historical dimensions which, which take place. But we, of course, need to be working on that. That's the patience and that's the passion part of it. Now, what we also need is basically a conducive framework around dialogue, because dialogue, and I agree with uh, the representative of San Egidio, has to take place on the national level, on the local level. The Burundians are masters of their own destiny. But we need to work around it. And in that sense, the role, for instance, of Parfa Nanga, the role of PBSO, but also the Security Council, and especially also the Africans, are very important. If we, as supporters of that dialogue, are unified in our approach, then things are moving ahead. If we are not unified and if we send out mixed messages, that creates difficulties. And we have been fortive in that, let's face it. We have been sending mixed messages. We have not been as unified as we should have been. So I think that's what we should be doing uh, better in the future. Um, what we also should be doing, I think, you know, once again, dialogue is a tool. The tool towards elections, which are also a tool. And these are basically what are tools towards stability, national union, and cohesion. For me, before the elections is after the elections and vice versa. We, we must keep the dialogue after the elections. I basically 
believe we know who will win. It's what we say in the AfD, uh, the, the, the ruling party who will win these elections. Uh, President Kuruziz is likely to be re-elected. So what if, what next, you know? How do we create a situation where we still can have unity, cohesion, and stability? That needs dialogue on the national level, which would be difficult and painful, but it, it's the other way around, but also on the international level. That's why I believe that the PPC, the configuration is so important, because it remains, as we speak, the only platform where we can speak with the government. The difference of PPC is it speaks with the government and the Security Council speaks about the government. And that is, from my point of view, a, a, re a really important issue. And just give you an example, um, Parfait was a bit skeptical this morning about the fact, you know, we heard news that saying that the FDD was boycotting um, the dialogue right now, which is taking place. Well, you know, usually I'm rather um, quite discreet, but I talked just a minute ago uh, with Albert Shingiro, the PR from Burundi, and said, listen, is that really the right thing to do that your, the, the majority party is really boycotting? Think about that, you know. Well, he just told me over the phone that he talked to his foreign minister a minute ago. So hopefully, you know, they will think it over. Hopefully. Yeah, but well, it's still better than no. You know, I know maybe they should have done it today, I agree. But at least they do it tomorrow. And, you know, that's the thing, you know, we are... Uh, what, what I realize is there is no such thing as linear progress. We move up, we move down, you know, we make mistakes, we, we go back, we go forward. What counts is that the general line of direction is moving upward or at least not downward. So that is what we're trying to do. So once again, you know, we're still here in a, in a situation of volatility, the jury is still out, but my general kind of a plea would be, let's continue on that. There is no other choice than keeping the dialogue. I really, I'm really thankful of people like Sunny Gidi and others who are really doing a tremendous job. No, really you do, and others as well. We need to do it on all levels, on the local level, on the national level, on the international level, and we need to be working together. And look at the big picture here, look at the long term uh, here. It, is, it's, it will continue to be a roller coaster. But hopefully, you know, we all get out fine at the end of this ride. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. So I, I myself, I have a bunch of questions I would like to ask, but I want to open it up to the floor and uh, get our uh, dialogue going here. So I'm looking for a couple of questions. And uh, so I'm going to start here in the front row. I know that's uh, Sarah from, but if you'd introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Sarah Douglas from UN Women, Peace and Security. Thank you so much to the panel and IPI for organizing this interesting discussion. I wanted to specifically come in on the point of what to do to better engage women and youth, and specifically women. Uh, from January 2015, UN Women has been supporting a nationwide network of women mediators in 129 municipalities across the country. And we now have a network in partnership with civil society and the national authorities of over 500 women who, since April, have mediated over 2,000 conflicts at the local level. Some of these have been about dialoguing between national security actors and protesters, uh, raising awareness amongst protesters of how to engage in nonviolent protests, advocating for release of imprisoned uh, protesters, and also encouraging populations not to move out of their homes unless absolutely necessary, so trying to reduce the flow of, dis of displaced people. Um, these women network, uh, women's network have developed a platform of demands targeted at the international and national actors, but the other thing that they have called for is equal partic participation of women in all dialogue opportunities, as well as opportunities for capacity building, training, networking, international trips, all those things that often, as we know, get to be the domain of the most elite and forums from which women are often excluded. So I just wanted to raise this with the panel and also remind uh, everyone of the obligation of the Secretary General's Seven Point Action Plan on gender responsive peace building, which calls for a minimum of 15% of all peace building funds, not just from PBF, but from all UN sources to be allocated to gender equality and women's empowerment. 
and ask the panel for their further suggestions and ideas of how to better integrate women and girls into the dialogue process. Thank you. So we're going to take a, a couple of questions at a time. I think I saw, Roy, if you'd introduce yourself, and then I have two in the back. We'll take about three, and then we'll have another round. Go ahead, if you'd introduce yourself. Roy Licklider, from, <clears throat> sorry, from Rutgers University. Um, this is a very different army, as you pointed out. So how's it doing now? <laughs> what, what, can, what are we seeing as this crisis starts to build? And is it likely to be a factor for stability or not so much if, if, and, if and when we get this election and the current government wins? One more in the back, yes. We'll get you the mic, thank you. In, in the way back, well. Uh, Rhonda Haubin and um, uh, Tuts, uh, I'm a blog columnist. Could you stand Tuts. up, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and my question, twofold. One, about the Mandela, I find that fascinating that the reconciliation was the, what you described about it. I'm wondering if there's a way to know more about that process and what, what was done and then a way to build on it because it just seems that in general, reconciliation's being lost in a lot of the processes and, and it just seems here it was a real factor. And then the second aspect of the question is, I don't have no idea, is there any internet access that can be a party to the discussion? Because there are ways that that can be very helpful, but I don't know if there's any, any level of that and if people have any access, cell phones, et cetera, and if there's any way that can be a party to being helpful to discussion. Thank you. I'm sorry. We're gonna take one more in the back. I think it's Matthew, because. He was. Thanks a lot. I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. I just, I, I wanted, I was listening from across the street and I was waiting to hear the term, you know, third term. It seems like a lot of, so much of this revolves around the constitutionality of the third term. So without, I guess I just wonder if the two, specifically the, the UN officials on it, do you think that the UN, obviously it's hard for it to speak about the a country's constitution, but it seems by not speaking, it was perceived as being basically on the side of the government by many. And I wanted to know, in terms of the UN, the tools that the UN has, whether continuing to use as peacekeepers soldiers that are you know, photographed and widely seen on social media as having fired unarmed demonstrators, should the UN speak more clearly about using and empowering and, and, and these guys, and should it do more about freedom of the press? Uh, Rhonda had asked about internet access, but at least five radio stations have been closed. The people fled the country. They wrote to the Secretary General, but it's not at all clear what the response by the UN was. And did and for Parfait, the, when, when the youth wing was being armed, or it was alleged to be armed, some people thought that the UN didn't say enough about it. It leaked, no one knows how it leaked, but it looked like the UN wasn't really going public enough, and is that a misperception? Thanks a lot. Okay, so we're gonna ask, uh, we'll go across the panel, and you can address those uh, questions as you like. So Parfait, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maureen. I wasn't expecting anything uh, nicer from my dear friend, <laughs> Matthew. Um, no, um, Matthew, you know, you know the story about uh, the leak cable. Uh, we have spoken about it, uh, and we have said, first and foremost to the government, that this has never been the way the UN communicates with states. But before that matter got into you know, public knowledge, uh, this was part of our daily conversations with the government. Um, there was no secret about the fact that we were worried um, about, you know, rumors of youth affiliated to political parties, in, in particular the, the ruling party, of course. It's more worrisome when it is affecting the ruling party, where um, are being, um, were in arm. I'm, I'm not saying we're being armed, but we're having harms. And, um, um, Today is no more a question for debate. I think the government has acknowledged itself that there was an issue. And that's why um, regional bodies like the ESC and the AU also have made the disarmament of youth affiliated to political parties a major um, requirement for a conducive election in Burundi. It's not the UN, it's the regional bodies themselves. And respecting the principle of subsidiarity um, um, everybody here also at the UN was waiting to see what the region would say. But the region has come uh, very clear on that matter 
and I think this should be um, appreciated. We did speak out, and we did ask for the authorities. Um, we said two things. We said it was first an acknowledgement that, uh, unfortunately, the disarmament process wasn't as successful as, as, as it, it should have been. And authorities themselves acknowledge that what was offered to them didn't make it possible to really absorb all the former um, combatants um, uh, who were involved in the, du du during the rebellion. So when uh, you know, the numbers were fixed for those who would uh, be part of the official uh, security forces, um, uh, it was still so many out there who would not be um, involved in any of these security forces and were given a little package and went away with nothing but to um, resort maybe to their weapons for maybe even just a survival. So this was a concern. And that's why when the whole issue became public, our senior advisors, including uh, Mr. Adamadieng, went public to ask for an investigation. Um, and we were not even willing to be part of it, but ask for the region with the authorities to get involved so that the process will be transparent and, and for, for two main reasons. One was to say uh, the level of um, um, proliferation of weapons was still too high for the country to go risk-free into this election. That's why we call for a further disarmament. And number two, we said it would be a, a good confidence-building measure when people will see that they will go into an election with a level of weapon that will be strictly, you know, uh, fairly reduced and, and make it possible to get more trust in the electoral process. So uh, but at the end of the day, uh, let, let, be, uh, let be clear on that. Uh, we are dealing with a sovereign country. And uh, Burundi, in all its history, you know, as, as we could um, um, uh, see in other places, um, it's, it's been an, a very fortunate country. The country has never collapsed. Uh, so we are dealing with uh, uh, responsible authorities, and we expect them to um, uh, do the right thing. And they have told their partners, and one of the points they said, they have already implemented 80% of the requirements by the AU. Um, which, of course, the UN does not endorse because we have not been able to uh, ascertain those. But uh, bottom line is, it is an assertive government. It is a, a sovereign government that, that, has, that is telling us all that um, uh, they're doing the right thing. So I, I think I will just stop here, Maureen, and agree with all uh, what was said before, including by Paul and, and Oscar, that we should remain engaged. We should remain engaged the day after and now we should remain engaged because there is still enough room to improve. And um, I, I simply want to tell the audience, I mean, for the, some of you who haven't been um, um, uh, to Burundi yet, that um, you, are, you, you were right to come this afternoon. Um, and, and, and I believe you are really uh, right to be concerned um, that we, we have all, as we engage in that country, um, uh, we, we, we were all very hopeful uh, that what, whatever will happen in, um, in, in, in Burundi would be a, an important indicator of what would happen region-wise. And, and we, we were also, uh, though uh, Burundi is maybe seen as a small country, but what is happening there could have you know, re, you know, uh, a, 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 a tremendous impact, either positive or negative, uh, uh, for the entire region. So as we engage in this country, I think we should never be, uh, let's say, um, um, too neither condescending because indeed this is a country of very uh, proud people and I think the, the point was made, we have to engage the government in a responsible manner. But at the same time, you know, because, and this is exactly the challenge that was, uh, Burundi was faced with, we said we leave this country but it would be for you to show the whole world that we were wrong to be worried about your future. And in my view, we, maybe we need not to be engaged because Burundians themselves can be able and should be able to talk to themselves in a, in a full ownership and, and national leadership on their own issues. But the reality is, I'm sorry, the reality is this is not yet possible. And people spoke about mistrust, and I think this is too in-depth 
in, into, into the, the psyche and the mindset of the people. That's why you have, we are right to be engaged and worried. Thank, thank you, thank you, Parve, um, and uh, your coverage of that issue. And I'd like to ask uh, Oscar, maybe you touch on some of the other things, status of the army, the role of women, and there's some other tough questions there about press, too. I think Parfait will come back to the army issue, okay. because I think he, he, he has the perspective and the, okay. and the knowledge. Um, just, just to state that I think what is important is that uh, the Secretary General actually has been making quite a lot of statements relating to the situation in Burundi, and has actually been expressing concerns and the importance of respecting uh, human rights, the freedom of the press, uh, a, a credible, inclusive, free, fair uh, electoral process. After all, the UN right now has quite a, an important electoral observation mission in place uh, on the ground as we speak, has deployed several uh, special representatives to facilitate dialogue. And I think, as Parfait was saying, it is extremely important that uh, the UN actually work and supports the efforts of the African Union and the East African community that have been very clear in terms of their own interpretation about the crisis in Burundi and coming up with a 15-point communique, which still remains valid uh, to this day, and it's the and it's the areas and are the issues around which a lot of the support for a national dialogue process needs to, to happen around. So um, I think it's quite important, and I think the region has also made it very clear that it's extremely important to avoid an institution, an institutional vacuum. I mean, this is, this is another issue of concern that is coming up uh, within and, and outside of the country. So dialogue is the way forward. Dialogue is the way out. Uh, dialogue will be, at the end of the day, what is able to keep building trust or addressing the issues of mistrust and, and some of what has been the more recent uh, possible deficits in, 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 in governance. But what's, again, important is to see how the institutions of the state are responding. And here may be important to put this in a historical perspective and see what is the situation as we move forward. In terms of women um, and their role in terms of, 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 of political actors, of empowered actors in this particular crisis, but before, now, and certainly after, um, we have seen the very important role that women in Burundi have played, particularly during the disarmament uh, process. Um, and I would almost dare say that uh, the trust that women have or don't have in some of the institutions is a significant indicator of the political process itself. And as we've seen, uh, the recent uh, refugee and internal displaced population actually is reflected by many women and children leaving the country uh, for whatever reason. And again, I, uh, Parfait was referring to this issue of the psyche in, in, in any post-conflict situation. How, um, how communication is actually being performed, what elements of truth, untruth, uh, the whole rumor or non-rumor, uh, becomes a fundamental uh, reference point uh, for many people as to whether they should pack and go or stay and stay put. And so I think importantly is that notion of freedom of the press. I think it's extremely important that the issues that affect all Burundians uh, be able to be expressed, because after all, uh, electoral processes are also about uh, understanding why people should vote for, for which candidates. So in that sense, in this particular context, and to your question, uh, Matthew, I think it's a very valid point, and I think that the government is seriously considering what it needs to do to respond to the request of the neighbors, of the region itself, in terms of many of these you know, democratically enshrined principles. Uh, just on the issue of the 15%, uh, as the peace building fund, we take this as a very uh, important and serious um, goal. 15% is even too low, uh, you know, of funding going to support women's empowerment. And we have undertaken, as recent as five months, a special initiative called the Gender Marker Initiative to see how we can increase the funding of our fund into projects that actually support political, economic, and other empowerment of women as per 1325 and many other, uh, the seven point action plan, et cetera. Um, but I think it is always fair to say that 
Uh, we also are working with national counterparts and institutions. And many times, because we are a non-operational entity of the UN, we're a financing entity, we're a political support entity, but a lot of the good ideas for these type of projects must come from the field, must come from the resident coordinator, his UN country team, working with national institutions and civil society, so that we're able to actually finance smart, politically driven projects of the sort that empower women uh, politically. And, and this, unfortunately, is still a big challenge within the UN. And here we count on UN Women and many other UN agencies to be very strategic in the way that we engage in formulating ideas that allow us to actually come behind and support these type of projects. But it is a priority for us. So I turn to you now, Don Angelo, and look forward to your comments, particularly on the reconciliation point or any others. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I want to speak about reconciliation because uh, uh, Burundi is a little country. Uh, uh, imagine that in the 50s, uh, and everybody knows everybody almost. Uh, if you speak with the Burundi people, uh, when they speak among themselves and they, they don't know each other, they start to say, are you, are you the nephew of that guy, or are you the cousin of the other one? And in two passages, they found a link between themselves. So uh, in the 50s, uh, some friends of mine in Burundi told me that it was possible for a child to cross the country simply going from village to village and uh, asking from some of the people which were linked to his own family. It was very safe. I mean, a, a child of uh, 10 years old was possible for him to cross the country without any, any, any problem, any, any fear. And uh, in this situation, imagine a civil war. Huh? Uh, I, I'm Italian. Uh, in Italy, we had a sort of civil war during the Second World War, and we are still with wounds on that. Uh, imagine the United States in the 19th century, they had the Civil War there, still uh, paying the consequences of that in terms of problems and tensions. So uh, in a civil war, the worst war is, being, is uh, among brothers, is the worst. Uh, I, I believe that a huge effort for reconciliation was done because uh, if, we, if we see the violence now in the country is a political violence and it's not a revenge. But, I mean, uh, could, could have been uh, violence for revenge because so many victims were there and so many people knowing we, who were the people who killed my brother or my father or my cousin and so on. So I believe a huge effort was done and a uh, huge uh, uh, and the wise uh, role was played by uh, religious leaders and the traditional uh, leaders at the level of villages and hills. And uh, uh, speaking about the army, I think that, uh, re yes, it's no longer <laughs> the same army of 95. And, uh, well, uh, it's not a perfect army. But uh, when I see that uh, there are, this army is participation, participating to peace, peace building missions in Central African Republic and in Somalia, and uh, with quite a success, uh, successful action. And if I see that when there are the demonstration in, uh, in, uh, in Bujumbura and uh, the police arrives to uh, stop the demonstration, the people in the streets used to hide themselves behind the soldiers, because they perceive that the army is there to guarantee their democratic rights. I mean, it's not a perfect situation, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, there was an attempted coup d'etat, but it was failed. Uh, failed uh, because of the attitude of the army. So I believe uh, in the past was difficult to imagine some of the elements I described. So therefore I say, uh, and uh, I, I followed the, the integration of the rebel groups in the army, I assure you, um, was quite, quite, uh, quite a process, uh, because uh, it was the the meeting of uh, people uh, who were looking at the other as a phantom or as a monster, and uh, slowly they 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 understood that they were fighting each other, uh, but they were not monsters. And uh, they, are dis they were discovering that they had both families and so, that's all. 
Great. Thank you. Now we want to get at least another round in. So I know I had, yes, I have a question there in the back again, and then we'll come over here to Jeff. If you could introduce yourself. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Duguje. I'm with the Union Theological Seminary. Um, I've been reading recently about the crisis in Burundi, and um, it seems we are not touching on one critical aspect. That's the cultural aspect. There's a reason why African leaders want to have a third term. We do not yet agree that uh, the current president is going for a third term. It's a debate. Some people say it's not a third term. Some say it's a, it's a third term. But there's a reason why African leaders in particular always want to have a goal at a third term. If we don't know why, we really can't solve the problem. So we need to direct our peace building um, approaches to the cultural um, specificities, you know, the, the cultural specifics, you know. Why do they want a third term? What can be done if we don't want crisis? Do we uh, peacefully get him out of office and give him some, uh, you know, ceremonial uh, position outside of um, politics, you know? These are ways we can uh, solve the problem culturally. We need to look at that, okay? And secondly, the religious aspect to the crisis. Like, uh, Burundi is uh, two-thirds Catholic, I read. I'm not sure. <laughs> Father Romano, you, you, you should know better. <laughs> I don't really know. But I think it's overwhelmingly Catholic. And that's a good um, advantage in dialogue and peace building. Uh, is there any way? I, I, I just read that the uh, Catholic Church has formally hands off the electoral process. Now that's uh, that's that's horrible. If it's to towards Catholic, that shouldn't happen. But in spite of that, is there any way this uh, religious um, majority can be used to our advantage as peace builders? If if uh, seventy percent are Catholics, can we bring them to the same table on account of that shared relationship? Uh, are we? Is there anything we can explore in that in that area? Thank you. Okay, so uh, the mic over here to Jeff, and if you'd stand and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hey, there were two intriguing remarks, at least to me, one by Oscar, one by Parfait, that I wonder if you might elaborate on a bit. Uh, Oscar, you had noted that um, perhaps the peacekeeping mission had been withdrawn a little too soon, and I wonder if you could describe to us how the presence of the peacekeeping unit made the parties in Burundi more malleable uh, than apparently they have been since, and what are the levers that either the Peace Building Commission Configuration Chair or the Peace Building Support Office or anyone else has had to kind of induce more cooperative behavior when you didn't have troops there? Uh, channeling aid, withholding it, whatever, what signals can you send? So the leverage, both while peacekeepers are there, the relative leverage, if any, when peacekeepers are gone. And Parfait, you had noted uh, tantalizingly in responding to uh, Matthew's um, question uh, that a Burundi actually, if, if you are successful there, will set a model for the wider region. And uh, Burundi seems to be completely self-contained from elsewhere. In DRC, everybody imagines all kinds of neighbors are involved. Burundi's, is it fair to say, is entirely internal. What makes it then a model if it does work? Uh, who will actually pay attention? What are the ramifications or repercussions? Great, so I think we, we've got a whole bunch of questions there. So I think for this round, if we can start with you, uh, Don Angelo, for any comments, and we'll come across and we'll end with Parfait. And this is also, if you have any other final thoughts, um, uh, since uh, you know we have a limited amount of time. So Don Angelo, the, the mic is yours. Yeah. Yeah, um, about the religious factor, I believe that um, uh, the peace. I mean, uh, uh, the Catholic Church and also the other Christian churches try to to do their best to avoid the present crisis, and in certain terms, um, it's a very difficult job because. Uh, you know better than me that if you said something, you can be accused of being one side. If you said another word, a single word, you can be accused of being the other side. So uh, uh, what I did was try uh, to uh, to emphasize the um, the need of the respect of the Arusha uh, agreement and the Constitution, and they took this position. Uh, 
uh, not an easy position, I, I can say. It was quite a br quite courageous position. And, uh, and also, also they pull out from the electoral process because uh, as a consequence of that position. I think in the same way they, will, they, they pull out, they can pull in if the situation has changed or something changed. I mean, as a, they are ready to do their contribution. They don't, I mean, their, their position is not political, it's uh, the position of people who are tr looking uh, with, the, the, with all, the, all the depth of people who are close to, the, to, 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 their, to their flocks. I mean, <laughs> uh, that the situation is, is bad. So, um, and uh, I believe that uh, in that sense, uh, um, uh, maybe that um, a sort of uh, spirit of national reconciliation is needed. Uh, even if, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there will be always an opposition in the government in Burundi as in any other country, but this does not mean that you are, you are going to hate each other. And that, 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 that should be changed. I mean, that's, that's, that's my opinion. Okay. So, Oscar, any Yes, again, I mean, I'm not the Burundi expert in this table, and so I'm going to be, you know, asking Parfait, who actually lived those critical transition moments uh, in Burundi. But I think it's, it's fair to say that, and I think um, the three ongoing reviews are going to be addressing this notion of how ready are we to transition out of countries, irrespective of whether it's Burundi, Mali tomorrow, Haiti after tomorrow. Uh, there's a persistent, and, and I think acknowledge, and if you read the, the first conclusions, recommendations of the Peace Operations Review, is that, you know, when you have the presence of a, of a mandated mission in place, usually these mandates come with that very important role of political dialogue, facilitation, reconciliation, investing in the institutions of the rule of law, of security, et cetera, et cetera. And it comes with a mandate, and it comes normally with the type of political uh, support and accompaniment of the source that can even be doubled up when you have also not just the Security Council, but the Peace Building Commission working in concert and, and supporting both these different types and styles of dialogue, whether we're talking with the governments or we're talking to the governments, um, or you know the type of decisions that happen uh, within uh, and, and, and the authority of the council itself. But one, one consistent, I think, issue that all of these re reviews will be addressing is how unprepared the UN seems to be the day after these missions leave, particularly on the issue of political dialogue, because this is a very difficult thing to do, to do right. Uh, external actors, yes, have a role they bring to bear the weight and the, um, and, the, and the instruments, the norms, the principles of the UN Charter to the picture. But at the end of the day, we're dealing with local capacities, national leadership, uh, opportunities of creating conducive. So the UN has that important role to convene, to create the space. But you know, at the end of the day, it is the national actors that have to have sufficient trust in the institution building, in the politics, in the reconciliation efforts to actually be ready to move on. And so that point about how ready, and I think Parfait was just alluding to this, uh, it was the day after sort of situation. One thing is that while we had Parfait on the ground, it was very easy to support his efforts to support political dialogue as a peace building fund, because we could quickly come behind the missions mandate and ensure that the UN country team was integrated into that concept. And I think Burundi, speaks to that very unique model of integration, which should be sort of the norm, you know, in terms of how we do peace operations. Uh, but today, the country team struggles to be an actor in political dialogue. That's why we have the regional SRSG coming into this picture and doing it. And, and I guess this just speaks to something that we need to do much better, prepare the transition, strengthen the UN capacity, and actually strengthen the role of the resident coordinator that functionally has a different type of function as a special representative. Thank you. So Parfait, today we're giving you the last word here on the panel. Thank you, um, Maureen. Um, the, 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 I fully agree with um, what Oscar has just said and, 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 and Father um, as well. Uh, the, the one thing that um, I wish we will not leave as an impression here is that um, 
uh, the government of Burundi is wrong and always wrong. I think we should not be leaving that impression because um, it is not true. Um, I think we should um, uh, say that, and this was mentioned before, that there has been a, there has been a lot of progress. The reason why we, we are here is because um, as many of you who invested so much in, in that country and, and in the UN, in the work of the UN that we so strongly believe in, uh, it is painful to see that between two choices, a wrong decision could be made. And it is a decision that is heavy. It is a decision that can impact the lives of ordinary people and throw in the wilderness, in despair, so many lives, women, young, and the vulnerables. So this is the reason why we are so passionate about what we're saying and what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, it is about people's lives. The second thing um, I'd like to say is, um, how could Burundi then be an example? Burundi could have been an example indeed and could still be. I think that potential is still there. Because beyond Burundi, it is the region, a region that has suffered so much of cyclical violence. With the exception of Tanzania, I mean, most of the country within the ESC have gone through or are still going through some kind of conflict. And that's why we, we have been, most of us even, including those who never been part of Arusha, when we got to read about that agreement, we, 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 we saw a gem and we saw an opportunity for a country to just do so much good, even though uh, we all agree also that Arusha has a value that is also, you know, um, um, uh, that should be reassessed against time. We don't believe that time has come to throw it away. And we believe that the country can still do more to move forward. If the reconciliation process was to be successful, and we all agree in the question on the army, that today we are absolutely in a different place and I agree with you, Father. The army we sing today is a much more professional army and as we condemn the coup, we have to acknowledge that it is because the army was able, you know, even though it's been fairly, you know, shaken and challenged by what happened, we still have so many um, in, the, in the wilderness, in the bush, and we don't know whether the option for those who have left would be to come back with more, you know, uh, revenge and start again, all over again. So, but so far the army has, you know, stood together and showed that some progress was done. And this is exactly why we're saying that the time now is not to believe that might is always right. Uh, it is not a time to throw everything and to believe that it is my way or the highway. Um, it, it is a time to believe that Burundi needs more than ever before, and each side should be prepared to make huge concessions. You, I say huge concessions for the country's stability to remain the guiding lamp as they look for truth and uh, as they look for reconciliation, greater peace and stability in their country. Thank you, Maureen. Um, we can spend the night and, and, and um, uh, still not really coming with, um, with uh, the right solution. But I will end here by saying simply uh, that this is a challenge for leadership in Burundi. Thank you. Thank you, Parfait. I, I, I really appreciate the, this panel because, one, they came and talked about a very difficult issue at a very difficult time uh, and a difficult situation that, that this, this moment, uh, you know, election is a moment of transition in Burundi. But I also admire that they, they put on the table some very good lessons to think about uh, for those of us here in New York looking at these issues every day, 
working with uh, the Peace Building Support Office, the Peace Building Com uh, Commission, those of you at the UN, and within the expert community. And so I thank again the Mission of Italy, the Peace Building Support Office, and all of you here today and our panelists especially for this uh, great, great discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.